So I think that uh, um, yesterday was a, a very good a, a meeting. Unfortunately, I, I got here with delay, uh, and I missed the talks. And, and t today we're going to focus on a um, on advances in cardiac intensive care. But mostly we're going to talk about a, uh, advances in neuromonitoring. And why is that? I'm going to walk through the talk a little bit, but first of all, I'm going to introduce where I'm coming from. We come from Barcelona. It's one hour flight from Alger. It's a short a, uh, cross of the ocean. Barcelona is a, a relatively small city in, in, in Europe. We have four million uh, people. And we have this, this hospital that some of you have visited. It's a non-profit organization that works with the public system. It's a children's and a mater maternity center, and we have a, 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 uni a university affiliated to, to the hospital. We are a large volume, a large pediatric volume in, in Barcelona. We are among the five top a, a, a children's hospital in, in, in Europe. And we have a, a relatively big a, a heart center. And when we talk about a uh, congenital heart disease, I think that there is a paradigm, uh, a paradigm that has changed over the last two decades. Because we have moved from what we expected 20 years ago, that was mortality, to something that happens right now, which is survival. So in 20 years, we have changed dramatically what happens in congenital heart disease. And if we look at the data that it's reported elsewhere, especially in the Society of uh, Thoracic Surgery in the United States and in Europe, mortality rates in developed, in developed countries are low. So it's, it's, it's strange to have mortalities about 5% in centers with high volume. And specifically, we have changed over the last 20 years, and we have achieved very good results in lower, more, in, in lower complexity surgeries. But if you see, the blue line, those surgeries with higher complexity have changed dramatically also over the last 10 years. On those surgeries with STAT-5, Norwoods, complicated TGAs, we have been able to tackle the mortality. So in developed countries, we have low mortalities right now. And this is something that is true, that it's expected that those centers with higher volumes have lower mortalities. So volume, expertise, give you better results. And this is particularly true with the more complex surgeries. And this is very well published. Those centers with bigger volumes, higher volumes, better surgeons, they have overall better results. So what happened with the centers that manage lower volumes? So what happens to centers like ourselves? Barcelona is a relatively small uh, city compared to uh, some cities in the United States. We have, different, we have more than one center. In Europe, as you might know, there is other problems like low birth rate. There is a high prenatal screening. So our, our volumes are relatively low. So we have in Spain, for instance, 19 different centers. And in Barcelona, a city of seven million, a region of seven millions, we have three different centers now. So each center has very low volumes, as low as 250 cases, 150 pound cases. So how we manage the mortality, how, how, we, how we have the, our, our results tackled if we compare ourselves to the bigger centers. Here in this graph, I, I, I have compared the volumes of Barcelona to the better centers in the United States, or even compared to the north of Europe. So our centers in Barcelona are very uh, low volume compared to other bigger programs. But despite those things, we have tackled the mortality. So over the last two years, we have achieved mortality rates lower than 1%. So I'm trying to say that because Mortality in developed countries is not the goal anymore. What we need to do is tackle other things. We have to focus on other important things. Because the majority of our patients, so more than 90% of our patients, or 85% of our patients, will get it to the adulthood. 
So it's very important. All what we do during the pediatric life will matter in the long term. Those patients will achieve to the adulthood with residual lesions, with heart failure, with neurological mortality, uh, neurological morbidity, things that will affect the quality of life of our, of our patients. So taking care of small details, it's important. And I think that maybe some of you saw a video like this last year, but I think that I always put the comparison between what we do with changing a wheel. All of us are able to change a wheel. And if you get a problem in the middle of the highway, you can just step out of the car and change the wheel. But you never know the result. It's different than having a Formula One team that in seven seconds is able to solve the problem. It's not about changing the wheel. It's about how well are we able to change that wheel because the results matter long term. And that's what we do. So we know that perioperative mortality nowadays in developed uh, centers is uncommon. By the end of this decade, we will have more adults with congenital heart disease than children being born with congenital heart disease. So concern is increasing about quality of life and neurodevelopmental outcome. And I'm talking about data in, 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 in Europe and developed countries, so, but this is important because mortality is, uh, uh, survival is achieved. There is more children that go into school age and those patients, those children have problems. They have neurodevelopmental delay. They have a, um, problems with a uh, adaptation at school. So overall, they have problems in the psychosocial um, sphere. So what we do matters. And when we talk about congenital heart disease, we have to talk about the longitudinal approach, therefore. The heart starts during the fetus life, and we have to follow it through the years until the adulthood. And we know that in every single part of this long journey, we have things that might impact the, the brain and that they might impact the quality of life of our patients. It is very well known that almost 30% of the patients that are born with a congenital heart problem, they have also associated cerebral malformations. They have problems in the formation of their brains. And that has been published since the early 2000s. The first report published in New, New England Journal of Medicine of abnormal MRIs on patients with congenital heart disease was done by Dr. Miller in Boston. And since then, we have several, several data that supports that issue. And I think that it's very important to understand why that happens. And in order to understand why, we have to go back to the fetal physiology. And it's very important to understand how the flows and how the oxygenation travels during the fetus life. And understand that the supraortic arch is the more oxygenated part of the fetus. And, those fetals, uh, and this fetal circulation gets altered during congenital heart disease. This is a, an example of what happens with the transposition of great arteries. So if, if we compare the fetal circulation, normal fetal circulation, <coughs> with that one happening in a transposition of great arteries, you see that in the transposition of great arteries, the lower oxygenation happens in the aorta. So the fetus from minute zero will see lower oxygenations in, during the fetal life. And post, postnatally, this transposition of great arteries will have very low oxygenation in the first aortic arch. So a transposition of great arteries during the full fetus life and immediately after being born has very low oxygenation during, the, um, during his life. Nobody has paid much of attention to that. And we have classified surgeries in a very surgical-driven way. So nowadays, we are trying to apply other classifications that might have a direct implication in the long-term outcome. And I think that this is 
a, a, a nice way to classify our, uh, our uh, congenital heart disease based on a physiological approach that has an impact into the long term. We have to uh, split the, the, the problems into two ventricles and a single ventricle repair, and then separate those with or without arch obstruction. And on top of that, we have to separate cyanosis versus no cyanosis. So if we, if we put these three things into the equation, we have a more a, a physiological approach to the congenital heart disease. And obviously, we can, we can use this classification to talk about every single a, a, a disease. The tetralogy of Fallot is a two ventricle repair with cyanosis. Transposition is also a two ventricle repair, but with more cyanosis. Left ventricular outflow tract, cyanosis and obstruction in the, in the aorta and so on. So this is a more physiologic way to define a uh, congenital heart disease because it will have an implication through adulthood. And this is important because we all know that we have a problem. We have a problem in brain development. If we measure head circumference in patients born with congenital heart disease, they have significantly smaller brains compared to the control groups. So this is control and this is congenital heart disease. So the majority of patients with heart problems, they have abnormal brains. And that's also true if we separate with a, uh, different entities. And you see that compared to the controls, transposition and hypoplastic left heart syndrome, those who have problems with oxygenation and those who have problems with arch obstruction will have a great impact in the morphology of the brains. So those are things that we have to take into account. Nowadays, there's nothing much that we can do rather than diagnosis, but maybe in the future, we should be able to do interventions, early interventions that will enhance oxygen delivery or nutrition delivery to those brains in order to alter the abnormal malformation. This is to become yet, but is something to uh, take care of in the future. Probably the most important period, and at least uh, something that we can um, intervene upon nowadays, is during the, the, the postnatal and the perioperative period. For a long period of time, we've been, able, we've been trying to protect the brain, doing low flow, cardiopulmonary bypass, hemodilution, we have tried several pharmacologic uh, treatments, but the reality is that nothing that we have done has significantly changed the, prog the neurological prognosis of our patients. And if you think about, this is one of our neonates. Neonates are very fragile, and in the postoperative period, they are fully, fully treated with several devices, several machines, and several interventions. But one of the things that astonished me, and this is, if you take a look at this very uh, critic uh, uh, neonate with on ECMO, open chairs, on the ventilator, there's monitors everywhere, but nobody's paying attention to the brain. So how come if the brain is the most important organ and the one that it's gonna a, um, play an important role in the long term of this patient, nobody's paying attention. So that's what we are trying to do nowadays. We are trying to find the holy grail. We are trying to find the proper intervention that will give us answers to what is going on in, into the brain. And we have done several things in the last years in order to improve our knowledge to the brain. The first thing that we have done is to apply the near-infrared spectroscopy technology, a non-invasive technique that measures oxygen saturation. And it's, it measures oxygen hemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin and gives us a number. And this number is a surrogate number of the central venous saturation and gives us information of the brain. Those are two sensors placed in the forehead of the infant that delivers a number. It gives us a beam of light that analyzes the superficial 
area of the brain and give us information about oxygenation. Unfortunately, there is no much literature that supports the use of the near-infrared spectroscopy in the congenital heart population. But we've been trying to elucidate this in the last two years, and, and I want to show some information that we have. This is <coughs> what happens in a very uneventful surgery by ventricular repair. Sensor blue is the right side, sensor gray is the left side of the forehead during the whole surgery. An eventful surgery, no fluctuations in the oxygenation. This is what happened in a biventricular a repair with arch reconstruction, with the patient going into circulatory arrest. So you see that we start with lower numbers around 70, the patient gets into pump, all of a sudden, the oxygenation goes up to 100. And when the patient gets into circulatory rest, the oxygenation of the brain goes down, finish the surgery, recover up to 100%, remove from bypass, and the saturation drops again. So big fluctuations of oxygenation during a, during a very short period of time. More extreme is what happened in a single ventricle patient. If you compare to the previous slide, the oxygenation starts from 40 to 50. The patient gets into pump, and we go all the way up to 90. Again, it drops when we go uh, into uh, circulatory arrest, and there is big fluctuations, up and down, up and down. So by measuring the uh, oxygenation during surgery, we are able to detect problems. This is a patient that had problem with the cannulation going into bypass. And you see that there is a big discrepancy between the right and the left a, uh, brain. Or this one, this, you see a big discrepancy between the right and the left. This patient, after surgery, develops sur uh, seizures. So something that is going during the surgical period will affect later. Something that we were, not, we were not measuring some years ago is giving us information about, about how the brain is acting. And this is data that's coming. This is data that we published some years ago those patients on the right that have abnormal neurological outcome overall have lower brain oxygenation numbers compared to those that act normally during the surgery. And this is data also that it's a little bit more complex to understand, but what surprised us is to see that if we separate between neonates and pediatric patients, Pediatric patients on pump, on cardiopulmonary bypass, have lower numbers compared to the neonates. And that has some implications that I will not go into details, but I will try to tease it apart later. The other thing that we are doing is measuring electrical activity of the brain, EEG, putting EEG uh, probes into the brain of our patients. And it's a uh, relatively simple EEG that it's called, uh, it, it's a four channel integrated electro electroencephalogram that can run during the surgery. And we know from ages working with EEG that there is very specific patterns. We have a continuous and discontinuous that might be normal. And then we have degrees of abnormal patterns. We have low voltages, isoelectric and status epilepticus very well-defined electrical activity. So the, the beauty of that is that by applying the EEG during our surgeries, we have realized that the neonate aggregates abnormal EEG compared to the pediatric. So there is more abnormal EEGs with the same surgeries if we compare pediatric versus neonates. And interestingly enough, if we compare, this is pediatric patients on cardiopulmonary bypass, and this is neonatal patients in cardiopulmonary bypass. You see that the neonates on cardiopulmonary bypass have more abnormal patterns of EEG. But interestingly enough, if you compare ne neonates repair out of bypass, non-bypass surgery, neonatal non-bypass surgery, with pedi pediatric bypass surgery, you see that those two are very similar. That gives us the information that the neonatal brain is very, very fragile. 
So we have to pay close attention to what's going on. So by putting all those numbers together, we come into patterns, patterns that we are trying to define, patterns of pediatric cardiopulmonary bypass, patterns into, that applies oxygenation and EEG. And we are able to classify surgeries based on oxygenation and electrical activity. But we were missing a, a, a piece of the puzzle. Of the puzzle. We went one step farther and we started to analyze neuromarkers. Neuromarkers about a um, neuronal damage or astroglial damage. And we've been trying to collect information about those markers. Specifically, we've been working with neuron specific NLAs and S100B, both markers of neuronal damage. And we've been trying to see if that gives us information about what's going on in the brain. So as you see here, both NSC and as you're going to see in the next one, S100B, both markers of brain damage increase right after surgery and decrease during the first week of life. And that happens the same thing with S100B. This is pre-surgery, immediately post-surgery, and then over a week, the numbers go back to normal. What we know and this is a very, a, a little bit complex uh, diagram, but what it's telling you is that those patients who are uh, neonatal patients who are repaired a little bit later have less increase of the neuronal damage after surgery. In other terms, if you wait a little bit long, long and longer to do the surgery, there is less neuronal damage into the neonate. This is very preliminary data, but it's something that has surprised us. So more graphical way to express, the neonates on cardiopulmonary bypass have a higher release of neuromarkers, which is significantly worse than the neonates of bypass and the pediatric population. Same graphs, so I don't want to go and I don't want to tire. Uh, you with those, those numbers. But the reality is by putting all these pieces into the puzzle, we are trying to delucidate what's going on into the brain. And I think that we are a little bit more closer to understand why our patients have neurological delays compared to the pediatric population. So we've been trying to, we've been studying that in, in, in a sequential approach. And we are studying that in the clinical arena. But something that we, we are doing now is translating this clinical information into the, uh, into the laboratory. So we are doing animal labs that focus into the brain damage. And this is a, a, a little bit complex uh, slide. But I think that the most important is that. So this is what we try to mimic in the lab. We have small animals that go into bypass. And we are trying to do all these experiments in small animals in order to reproduce all these results in, 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 the, in the lab. So I think that overall, th this is giving us important information. We know that the pediatric patients experience longer durations of low oxygenation. But despite the pediatric patients being or having lower oxygen saturations, the neonates are the ones that have more uh, electrical damage and more uh, neuromarker damage. So neonates undergoing cardiopulmonary bypass are very fragile. They have very fragile brains. And it's our responsibility to, to pay close attention to those, uh, to those neonates. Because again, what we're doing is treating patients from the fetus to the adulthood. And every single, thing, every single thing, thing that we do matters. That's why in a heart center mentality, we have to apply a longitudinal approach. We have to start following our patients from the fetus life, and we have to follow them until the adult, uh, adulthood. It's very important to work as a team and trying to do the same thing that the Formula One uh, pit stop does. So, it makes a, a, a significant difference. I, I think that video is not running. But it's not about changing the wheel. It's, it's about how well are we changing our wheels.
and thank you very much.